Freddie Mercury had a secret that he kept well hidden from the public. His stage presence was second to none, and so was his poker face during interviews. The 2018 film Bohemian Rhapsody covered only parts of Freddie's personal life, but there was one person whose impact was bigger than anyone else at the height of Queen's popularity. Welcome to Behind the Music. In this video, we dive into Freddie Mercury and Jim Hutton's relationship and how Jim became one of the few people in his life who could give Freddie comfort in the lead up to his death. So why was this man such a stabilizing force for a chaotic rock star? And why was Jim upset about what he was left after his partner's death? Stay tuned to find out. He was quiet, quite, very reserved, um, just plain ordinary Joe Bloggs on the street really, because he wasn't. The Queen of Rock by the mid-1980s, Freddie Mercury was already a global sensation. He was the lead singer and songwriter of Queen, a band for whom everything they touched turned to gold. Queen had its origins in the early 1970s, with most of the members meeting at university. When Freddie eventually talked himself into the band, after following them around as a fan, he joined Brian May and Roger Taylor, suggesting the name Queen for their new group. Freddie was the perfect frontman, giving energetic performances, working for the crowd, and as a former fashion student, always had a dramatic outfit to match. In contrast to his bandmate's more conservative personality, Freddie's had an eclectic character, having grown up in a first-generation migrant family and defied expectations to pursue an artistic career. Mixed with some musical experience growing up, Freddie had developed an incredible versatility, both in singing and songwriting. His range spanned from the ballad operatic rock of Bohemian Rhapsody to the more traditional rock of songs like Crazy Little Thing Called Love. Queen quickly brought a new style to rock and roll, and Freddie's enormous vocal range from baritone to soprano hadn't been seen in the industry before, making him the biggest star of them all. So, by the mid-1980s, the band had released two self-titled albums, along with nine others including A Night at the Opera and Flash Gordon gaining worldwide acclaim and sending the band all over the world. Behind the scenes, success had made Freddie drift apart from his girlfriend Mary Austin and he began having affairs with men, leading him to eventually confide about his sexuality to Mary. The two remained close friends for the rest of their lives but never again were involved romantically. Global fame along with sparkling charisma had given Freddie the choice of virtually any partner, but in 1984, he met an unassuming man in a London nightclub who didn't recognize him, nor did he seem to care. Despite Freddie's interest, the man wasn't impressed by Freddie's antics, refusing a drink from the superstar. It was only more than a year later that Freddie's advances finally worked when they bumped into each other again. Only then was Freddie formally introduced to someone who would change his life, Jim Hutton. Nothing really, no, I had, I had, not, I had nothing at all to do with music. I still don't. It's great, actually. <laughs> Jim Hutton was from a different world. Born in County Carlo, Ireland, by the time the two met, he was working in London as a hairdresser and had never been impressed by the fame or wealth Freddie had acquired. But soon after courting Jim, the two began living together. Being a gay couple in the 1980s was challenging. Same-sex rights were limited and the decriminalization of homosexual acts had been passed less than 15 years earlier. This was made worse by Freddie's high profile. The media often speculated about Freddie's sexuality, describing his performances, character, and lifestyle as closeted and cap. But Freddie refused to publicly address his sexuality and rarely appeared in photographs embracing Jim who was already out. Freddie's life was full of partying, drugs, and chasing men. Freddie's mansion in Kensington, West London had become a nightclub of its own, regularly hosting guests and other celebrities. This soon led to problems in their relationship. On more than one occasion, Jim caught Freddie with another man, first in a London nightclub. The second time, Jim offered up a firm ultimatum, either be serious about what they had or end things. Despite his electric persona on stage and rock star tendencies, Freddie was quiet and reserved at home. He found peace in Jim's security and his strength, and he wasn't willing to give that up. Freddie decided that their relationship was more important and made the commitment to settle down. The two wore wedding rings on their fingers, despite gay marriage not yet legal in the country. Jim had moved in, but he preferred to work as a personal gardener and retain his hairdressing job than stay up all hours of the night partying. He was more interested in creating a home for Freddie to return to, and in the coming years, Freddie was going to need it. The couple were incredibly private about their personal lives. It was impossible to escape tabloid gossip and speculation. 
Jim did travel with the band. They kept their distance in public, but Freddie's perceived flamboyant and campiness was evidence to many that there was something the singer wasn't being open about. When asked directly whether he was gay, Freddie claimed that he had only experimented as a teenager, but that those days were behind him. In private, though, in their downtime, Freddie was living a life together, enjoying the simple life of staying in and talking. Photos from their personal archives showed how tender they were when alone, often accompanied by their cats. They had created a home together. But their relationship was only destined to last seven years. In the 1980s, celebrities like Liberace, Perry Ellis, and Rock Hudson had already lost their battle with AIDS, a deadly disease ripping largely through the gay community. Freddie Mercury was about to become the largest name on the list after he was diagnosed in 1987. He said that he would understand if Jim wanted to leave him, knowing that the following years would be difficult. But his partner wasn't going anywhere. Jim would stay by Freddie's side and nurse him until his last moments. In the year of his death, Freddie recorded music with Queen in Switzerland, asking for music to be given to him despite barely being able to walk. The band had been aware of his condition for several years, which had been largely hidden from the public. He participated in filming a music video for These Are The Days Of Our Lives, but his appearance raised concerns in the media that Freddie was nearing his final days, and soon after returned to his Kensington house. Pictured by Jim just a few months before his death, Freddie stands in his backyard. His once big frame is visibly smaller, having lost an enormous amount of weight. As his condition deteriorated, he refused medication. In his final few days, Freddie wanted to see his paintings downstairs. Too weak to walk himself, Jim half carried him down as he held on to the banister. It was only a day before Freddie died that he went public with his illness, though rumors had been swirling for the past half decade. On 24th November 1991, Freddie Mercury died from bronchial pneumonia, worsened by AIDS. When Freddie Mercury died, Jim was left £500,000 in the will, which would be over $1.75 million today. Although Jim insisted that it was also his partner's wish for Hutton to stay in his Kensington house known as the Garden Lodge where they had lived together, it had by then become a makeshift memorial for Freddie. The singer had left the house to his ex-partner Mary Austin, who had been visiting often in Freddie's final weeks. Three years after Freddie's death, Jim published the memoir, Mercury and Me, as a way to grieve the loss of his life partner. It was mainly from this book that the public was able to learn about how intimate the couple was. Jim Hutton moved back to Ireland after Freddie's death, where he remained for the rest of his life, and after battling AIDS for years, later died in 2010 from a smoking-related condition. Though not directly advocating for LGBT rights, in Freddie Mercury's death, he became a symbol of diversity, pride, and breaking social norms. His strong, committed relationship with Jim Hutton shaped his life profoundly, and in 1992, a year after he had passed, a tribute concert in his honor raised money to fight AIDS. To this day, Queen music is loved by many in the LGBT community. Freddie's story is one about struggle and acceptance. His name, first and foremost, lives on in the history of rock and roll. But his relationship with Jim Hutton shows the deeply caring, private, and shy man who is behind the artistic genius. That's it for this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more in-depth videos that go behind the music. We'll talk to you again in the next